Live from the Washington, D.C. area, all empowered citizens need to know about intelligent use of resources, smart governance, inclusive communities, smart industry, and healthy, thriving urbanization. This is Smart Sustainability, the TV talk about shaping a sustainable future in the digital age with Nicolette Stividar. Self-healing the body, starting with plants, herbs, how to best use them to support your health, upgrade your well-being, and heal the more serious issues. Welcome to Smart Sustainability this evening. I'm Nicolette Dividar. Last week, we talked about taking self-responsibility in health, what that looks like, etc. Today, I want to start diving more into herbal medicine and how you can proactively use it. We live in a very special time, you see, where self-healing is becoming more and more possible, palpable, and is hugely on the rise. For most of us, that marks a stark contrast and detour or return from how we saw our health in the past how, and how we used medicine before to how we're going to use medicine now. It also increases our knowledge of plants and brings them back into our life. It's, it starts as a series, actually I started a series on it on YouTube last week where you can learn more on plants and herbs and even recipes every week, so I do invite you to go there. But this week, I want to talk also about plants, how plant medicine and self-healing are match made in heaven. And because that was such a big topic when we did our very first episode, I want to periodically extend it also into smart sustainability as well, to keep broadening our talk about plants and plant usage. So tonight, we talk about six new plants, how you can use them, and then talk about the more serious applications of herbal medicine to heal and support therapies you may have to go through or may be doing. Words like detox, how to deal with inflammation, and of course with Valentine's just around the corner, we might just take a little detour to talk about libido and how you can actually use plants for that as well. Joining me tonight is Brian Keenan, Dr. Brian, as he's commonly called. He's a naturopathic doctor, herbal specialist, and fantastic to tell us how to actually use those plants. I'm excited to hear more about the new herbs and hope you are too. Great to have you on, Brian. Thank you so much for having me. I Nothing I love more than to talk about plants and help people learn about them. And yes, I did notice that actually last time already. So let's, I want to right start in. So just as a little summary for the people who haven't seen last week's episode. Um, let's talk about, last week we spoke a little bit about the, the usual go-to culprit, so to speak. So the ginger, we talked about garlic, we talked about ashkawanda, and also for those very few who could not use that, like women who had hot flashes during menopause, I remember that very quickly. Um, so this week I want to talk a little bit more about six new plants, what we're going into. Before we get to that point, Brian, let's recap a little bit why are self-healing and plants a match made in heaven? Um, well, the simple answer is because we grew up with them. Our genetics, our, the whole crux of humanity has evolved to use plant medicine as part of normal everyday health care. Of course, in ancient times before modern medicine, uh, plant medicine had to play a much more heroic role. And now it has a beautiful chance to do everything it's always been doing. That's the, that's the magic of herbalism, is that these plants have been doing and helping human health from the get-go that's what they do it's part of their life cycle um yes they are taking care of themselves and we want to respect our plants and and take care of them and take care of nature um and the environment and similarly these plants have been useful for a long time with the advent of things like antibiotics and other medical advances you know they there's certain aspects of heroic medicine that we no longer need to call upon all the time for herbalism that doesn't mean all the other benefits are lost like herbs that help gently tonify the immune system, herbs that help 
get rid of inflammation, herbs that help us detox and transform our experience, and maybe even a couple herbs that help us get in the mood and have a more um, comfortable libido and sex life. Um, all of this is possible with herbalism, and herbalism is enjoying uh, an, another trot into the spotlight as it so rightfully deserves. Exactly. But I, I want to bring up a really important point, Brian. So when we look at this, why is this such a good combination to have so between humans and, and herbs or human mm -hmm. and plants? Do we have part of the plants in us and we just got away from that worldview? Or w why is this such a powerful, why does it actually have such a powerful effect on us? Mm -hmm. There are a lot of ways to answer that question, and we don't have all the time to, to do it. But I'm going to say a few things. Firstly, human physiology, our biology, the way our body works internally through signaling, hormones, uh, the endocrine system, all of that right, involves a symphony of messages that the body sends. It sends messages to itself to do something a little bit more, increase metabolism, decrease heart rate. It does all of these things all at once. Everything's happening all at the same time. The same is true of plant phytochemistry. So when we ingest plants, be them the ones from our diet or ones that we use specifically and only for medicinal purposes, it's the same thing in that we're getting a thousand phytochemicals, herbal chemicals that are coming from the plant into our body and our body responds to this gentle multifaceted signaling very much in the same way that it gently and multifacetedly, if that's a word, signals to itself. And so you have this version of chemistry that marries human physiology in such a pronounced way. And it's different from pharmaceuticals. And this is, as I said last time, not to say that pharmaceuticals are bad. They're fine. They have a place, but they tend to do one thing. Whereas herbs, method. I remember we, that when you said that last time. <laughs> yeah, we, we here in, in, in the naturopathic medicine ring, everybody has a space, everybody has a voice. And this includes a lot of our amazing medical advances. What we work on and what I why I come out here to speak is to say, let us not forget the other side, the the plants, nutrition mental health, all of these things have very powerful and marked medical uh, weight as well. And so today we'll talk about the plants. So how much, so how, how open do you have to be for the plants to actually be effective? So in other words, can it be that if you're mm. more connected to plants and herbs in general, there is mm. a more direct effect or you feel it more subtle? versus if you don't believe in it and you just say, well, let me just try it out and see what happens. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a wonderful question. And it's important that we take a moment to look at everything that that question implies. So for instance, when we do our medical research, right? Like if you go into research realm and look up the human trials that we've done on herbs, these are double blind placebo controlled trials, just like we would have for a pharmaceutical. And we're watching to look for an effect. Mm -hmm. Conversely, if a person is very well, uh, is uh, let's say it prefers herbs they have a bias towards herbs they want to use something natural they don't want anything from the western medical tradition um that becomes couched as placebo right because now they they're starting to condition their mind they're conditioning what they're going to experience and that conditioning that anticipation absolutely is something in research we have to account for and that's why you'll see things like double blind placebo we're trying to remove bias i argue that there is a benefit to this because herbs are used often casually as part of everyday life as part of normal healthy things that people do to protect themselves or to I improve their energy gentle things we're not talking about these high force interventions where if you need a surgery because you need it then you should go get it right. herbalism is living in this place where oh i'm exhausted i you know have a hundred zoom calls a day and by the end of the day my eyes hurt and i'm exhausted and maybe there's a couple herbs that help gently tonify me 
if someone comes in and says, oh, well, you knew that herb would do that, so maybe the effect is invaluable, I say this was a cheap, safe, and appropriate use of the herb. I think that uh, pharmacologically the herb has an effect. And if people feel connected to the plants, there's an additional benefit. Because when you feel connected to plants, you become connected to the world. And when you become connected to the world, it can feel a little airy-fairy, it can feel a little hippy-dippy, and yet it's actually really important that we feel connected to things other than ourselves. And I think plant medicine does this in a really elegant way. Actually, and, and that's really also something that I, I wanna bring up here, Brian, because mm -hmm. to me, that perfect exchange between plants and us, after all, we share each other's breathing, so to speak. So to me, this is one of the most poignant things of having this perfect exchange. The plants need, they actually need the CO2 we're breathing out to produce more O2 for us. So it's a perfect cycle and a perfect um, exchange that I think that alone should tell us sort of, yeah, there's a little bit more to it, right? Absolutely. Exactly. Absolutely. Now let's talk plants. And, and I, w one more thing, when we, when we spoke and you said plants is a more gentle thing, yes, there are the more gentle things I think you can treat, um, you can just increase your well-being and benefits, etc., mm -hmm. which what we're going to talk about. But then there are also, just for viewers to understand, more serious issues where you can use plants wonderfully in a more gentle and holistic approach and supportive mm -hmm. function. Absolutely. Okay. Let's ease into, Brian, what did you bring to us this time? Let's go first. We, we're going to talk about six herbs. Let's start with the first. All right. Uh, pick a topic. Would you like to talk about inflammation or detoxification? I think we should start with the detox. Okay. And actually, as we go into detox, I think I'm not so sure many um, viewers mm -hmm. are aware of what detox is. I know a lot of Europeans mm -hmm. are usually aware of detox because we mm -hmm. detox regularly. But I think with uh, in, in the U.S., it's not quite so common. So just give us a spectrum. Brian, what's a detox? So yeah, detox, short for detoxification, is something that honestly most humans will feel the desire to do um, throughout their lifespan. They will go, I need to stop doing blank. I need to remove something in order to increase my overall well-being. Um, I think that instinct that is in us is very much well understood and shared. Mm -hmm. When we're talking about detoxification herbs, we are talking about herbs that in one way or another benefit the normal, healthy, physiological detoxification processes of the body. This goes back again to the tenets of herbalism. We're not trying for the most part to override human physiology, override your body's natural and innate systems. Mm -hmm. We're trying to tonify and harmonize with those desires. Mm -hmm. And so our detoxification herbs are herbs that in one way or another benefit what our body's already doing in the place of detoxification. So what does our body do to detoxify? Uh, there's a lot of ways because it does it all the time, but your breath, if you've ever, um, if you ever drank too much alcohol, for instance, and had a weird sour breath the next day, that's because your lungs are detoxifying. Things are coming out through the breath. Your sweat, your liver, your kidneys. These are all different systems that our body has that are all working together. Some do it more than others um, for detoxification. For instance, the liver being the most prominent, which brings us to our first herb. Okay, and hang on a second, just to, to clarify here for our viewers also. So when we talk about detoxification, you can detoxify your whole body, but you can also detoxify certain organs, for example, right? Or with a focus on certain organs, like for example, the yeah. liver or so. Yes, so the, so the herbs will have organ affinities for the greater focus of detoxification. Because think of detoxification in general as a whole body systemic thing, body, mind, and spirit. There are different ways that our body is always trying to get rid of things we don't need. What herbs we have learned through studying them over the millennia is that some herbs are really good at certain organs or certain ways or pathways to detoxification, mm -hmm. and they tonify them very well. Um, and that those are herbs that we hone in on and we make little notes about, and we'll talk about them today. Um, for instance, liver herbs, you know, herbs that really benefit the liver. And there are human trials, and we really studied this in a, you know, in the full scientific method. Um, is milk thistle? 
Milk thistle is a seed that we use, and it has an uh, it's called Silibum marinanus. That's its Latin name, mm -hmm. and it contains silimarin, a chemical that we isolated from that plant from the seed that has such pronounced value that we named the chemical after the plant silimarin for an herb that's Latin name is Silibum, which is a lovely name. Okay. Um, milk thistle is one of my nearest and dearest detox herbs for a variety of reasons. It's extremely extremely safe. Um, they give it to children. It's okay. Anybody over the age of two is technically safe to take milk thistle. It has a variety of ways to apply it. Um, you can use a tincture, You can use, which is an alcohol extract. You can use the powder of it and put it in your smoothies. Um, I actually used to have milk thistle as part of my oatmeal that I was had when I had some around. The other reason I love milk thistle is that it's extremely sustainable. We use the seed so we don't kill the plant in order to get the medicine. Right. And then also milk thistle itself is considered a weed by many a garden. I know that's what I wanted to bring up because to me the, 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 that thistle type is the perfect example that all weeds have mm -hmm. a purpose and even as in, in our day, modern day life, you know, you know that at home also, very mm -hmm. often we think that weeds are kind of, um, they disturb us in our garden, you don't want them, how, much, how many hours do you spend on your knees or with things to actually take weeds out when there is a strong medicinal purpose for most of them? Yes. And that Absolutely. does need to be said. Another important uh, uh, weed is dandelion. Yep. Now, dandelion made its made a, got a little uh, fashionable. It was a little bit uh, cool to be eating dandelion greens in your uh, high end salads, which I thought was hysterical because everybody has access to dandelion greens. Um, but they were they were gourmet for a while. Um, but that said, the leaves of dandelion actually tonify the kidneys they help with diuret they act as sort of a botanical diuretic mm -hmm. whereas the root of the dandelion which is also medicinal functions much more similar to the milk thistle i just mentioned mm -hmm. it's a little bit more liver focused it's helping the liver um the other thing that dandelion root does better than milk thistle is that dandelion root and many almost all roots but most roots are prebiotic that means our probiotics, our gut microbiome. So if you've ever taken a probiotic, you're trying to help that system. Mm -hmm. Prebiotics are chemicals, mostly polysaccharides, if for a fancy word, that our gut bugs use to nourish themselves. They digest it and they get stronger and they do better for it. Um, and then when we have a healthy microbiome, we have a healthy digestive system and the rest follows. And uh, dandelion root, very, very useful for that. Mm -hmm. Now, how do we imagine this? Give us some of the, the practical uses. So when you have them in your, in your yard, for example, can mm -hmm. you literally just go and pick them up? You absolutely can. There's a couple caveats. One, <laughs> if your lawn is frequented by uh, the neighbor dog, um, and I do have to warn you that you may want to really be diligent about washing because um, it's very common. The other one, of course, is pesticides. Yeah. So for a lot of people, they place a lot of pesticides on their front lawns and still one, two uh, dandelions make it through that pesticides. If a lawn is being treated heavily with fertilizers and pesticides, dandelions will bioaccumulate. They're pulling those toxins, just like they pull toxins out of you, they will pull toxins out of the soil and they will sequester them in the root. And once they've done that, it's not a good idea to eat them. Um, so making sure if you're if you have a backyard that you don't do anything to you just let nature take its course and you mow the lawn but you have some dandelions those roots are going to be fine dig them up dry them out and you can make them some people make them even into a powdered coffee as a coffee substitute um, but you can eat them you can roast them you can make them into tea okay so we were still on the detox part. So we talked a little bit about the milk thistle. We talked about the dandelion. And you can mix and mingle the two, right? Absolutely. I, I encourage you yeah. to do so. Now, yeah. do those have to be dried? The milk thistle seeds, not as much. 
You don't have to dry those out. In fact, if you can get them fresh, that's great. Um, the root, you can also do fresh or dried. If you go to buy it online, it's of course going to be dried. And there's not a lot of drawback to it being dried out. Whereas with certain leaves, um, fresh can be better. We'll talk about go to cola in a moment. Yeah. That's an example where I love the fresh. It's just hard to find it. Um, but And so you can use it dried. However, if you can get it, it's a delicious salad green. And we do need the bitters, right? We our do. Body Which needs the brings bitters. me to, well, dandelion root is bitter, yeah. but also our brassica plants, right? So, you know, in the last segment that we did, which by all means, everyone go find our initial, our initial episode, um, we talked about food as medicine. And that's another one of the great strengths of herbalism is that herbalism was not made with pharmacology and drug making in mind about how do I make something into a capsule? It was how do I take this medicinal plant and and make people able to take it. And so culinary arts and me herbal medicine go hand in hand. And to that fact, when we're thinking about detox herbs, I can, I can wax poetic about all these medicinal herbs and their unique traits, but I have to bring us back to salad greens, kale, chard, broccoli. Yeah. These herbs are loaded with phytochemicals that are really, really good for us, fiber that is really good for us, and is, you know, if you don't know where to start with herbal detox, start with some brassica family plants. Okay, so when we talk about detox, Brian, how long is sort of like, how many days, how many weeks should you mm -hmm. do a detox? Because this so, is not something mm -hmm. you just take once and then you think, you know, it's all taken care of, right? There's a lot of different ways to go about it. It depends, one, on who you are and what you need to detoxify. So, for instance, in many, many cultures around the world, there are sort of designated detoxification times, yeah. such as spring, which is upon us, um, where you spring cleaning the house also means spring cleaning yourself where you avoid alcohol, avoid vices, avoid fatty foods. You focus on spring greens, new lush foods, um, and you use that to cleanse yourself. Now let's take for sake of argument, somebody who is uh, overweight, they became a couch potato during the pandemic. They don't know how to get back to themselves. They, they're just really, they just feel so backed up. They might want to do something that's a little bit stronger, which is a little bit more focused. There will be a dietary component, but also they're going to use some herbal products that they have found. And, we, you know, again, there are many. That I still would say my recommendation would be two weeks on, two weeks off. Because if you're going to do any sort of serious detox or a, a detox that includes herbal laxatives um, that force your body to... Um, to detoxify itself. I don't like the idea of people doing that long term mm -hmm. because our body is meant to be the arbiter of our health. If we give it a little boost, we also need to be able to step back and go, what, what changed? Mm -hmm. um, so for people who go into detoxes, I also ask them, what are you looking for? What do you want from this detox? Mm -hmm. Because you need to have some benchmarks to know if it's useful or not. Yeah. Okay, so we talked a little bit about dandelion, about milk thistle. Let's go to the other ones now that are still, are we still in the detox category? Uh, the only one we skipped was go to cola, uh, which yeah. is another wonderful detox herb that I love. Yeah. Um, uh, we, the reason I like go to cola, its Latin name is Centella Asiatica. Um, go to cola is a wonderful detoxification herb that does support the liver, but it also supports the kidneys. But here's the other reason I like it. It supports the mind. Gochu Kola is a study herb. It's a student's herb in India where it helps with mind, focus. And a lot of people who are trying to do detoxes, one of the main things they have is brain fog. They yeah. just can't focus. So what better than an herb that helps with focus while simultaneously helping the body do its natural detoxification processes. Yeah. And again, we run into why herbs are useful. They have multiple uses. They do a couple things at once. Yeah. Now, let me ask you one question, Brian, which I find um, really important. And it, 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 I've noticed that, for example, depending on, so let's say you're 
um, a, 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 I know, so if you're sort of a Central European, I mm -hmm. tend to correspond better to some of the native plants for detox, etc., that I grew up with as a child. And even though I've changed locations, I find for me some of that still works better than, mm -hmm. for example, um, herbs that are more Asian, etc. Is mm -hmm. this something that can have an impact on people so that your your body may be more prone let me put it this way to mm -hmm. respond perhaps faster to certain mm -hmm. herbs that you are basically your body is used to that is a wonderful question because it brings up a lot of different things so there's a couple ways again i, I this will become a theme i will answer things in five ways most questions um so for instance one simple answer is no. Uh, human, the human genome is similar enough across cultures that most herbs will work and do a certain thing. Mm -hmm. However, what you're speaking to is also what I like to call like the Rolls Royce of herbalism, which is if you can find local native plants that are the closest to you, there may be a benefit to that epigenetic, epigenetic meaning above genetics, extra signaling that occurs, not just at the DNA level, um, that could have some benefit. But that benefit percentage is going to be outweighed by if you just don't use herbs because they're not from your area. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. And so like I, I, there's, a per, there's a perfect world, and then there's our world. And so um, both have a place. Like, there's a point to what you're saying, absolutely. And in the modern era, I do just want to give people herbs that we know work well. Yeah. Third thing I'll say about it is that sometimes there's just herbs that are absolute all-stars, no matter what culture, where you came from, who's a what's a. Um, a good example of this would be ginseng right yeah. so panax ginseng chinese ginseng comes from asia and yet it is one of the number one herbs that gets put in um energy supplements because no matter who you are it will boost your energy it's just that effective yeah okay so i want to switch topic and go mm -hmm. to the inflammation part but before we go there brian can you give us just sort of a rough outline when somebody says i'm really interested in detoxing i've heard i should do two weeks on two weeks off we've heard some of the plans mm -hmm. but where for example what would that look like would i start with the tea maybe in the in the for breakfast and then have more salad at lunch or can you give us just a little bit of or some soup you know in the evening just a little mm -hmm bit of an overview what's the starting point for that if you were okay. to do your own detox for example right you're you're taking your power into your hands and you're like i'm going to detox the first thing i'm going to do is ignore herbalism and tell you to eat fiber eat vegetables eat healthy green plants get clean water remove dietary vices alcohol fatty food fried foods this is the that's your foundation that's just your ground zero anyone wants to do a detox if you take our or the herbs we talked about today while still drinking and smoking and doing other things, they're still going to help you. But I think we can all agree yeah. you're you're adding negative things to the system. So that's the step one is get that diet in order. Then you're going to want to use your detoxification herbs on a relatively regular basis. That said, I prefer teas, like herbal teas that people can make with detoxification herbs. You can go to the store and you'll see like everyday detox teas. As long as these don't have laxatives in them um, and they're just more general, they can be great to drink throughout the day. They can be wonderful. That said, not everybody's a big fan of tea. So they think I'm going to go get a capsule from super supplements, vitamin shop, some place. That's okay, too. That's okay. Yeah. Um, take those detox herbs. You're going to take them like one to three times a day for two weeks and then take a break. Yep. Okay, now we need to switch and talk a little bit more serious stuff. Because when we talk about the detox, it's very simple. It's for everyone. For you at home, you can do it. And I hope you actually, if you've never done it, I can only tell you. I mean, I, I go regularly detoxing. And it's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful thing for your whole body and, and overall, I mean, for the mind. And you get so much energy and you feel really a lot better. Mm -hmm. So when we do that, we, we talked about the detox. Now, Brian, I want to switch gear and talk about the more serious 
things mm -hmm. because we know there are uh, a lot of people out there that are facing more serious health issues. For example, people who are undergoing cancer, people who are undergoing chemo treatments, people who are undergoing all sorts of other stuff. Let's talk a little bit about can herbs mm -hmm. support that? Absolutely. And this is one of those places where herbalism gets its, you know, um, gold stars where people can imagine that this happened. One of the other things is that herbalism is for the most part intended to work perfectly in tandem with your care, your, you know, chronic illness care team. Now, of course, as a disclaimer, everybody who is being treated by a physician, you need to run this by your care team because you shouldn't be adding things that they don't know about. That said, there are many, many herbs, and it depends on what you need from them, That, but they are all wonderful and slot in great for people who are in a tricky situation, going through a lot, exhausted, frustrated, in pain. There's a lot of herbs. We're going to talk about a couple really broad spectrum ones today, yep. and if there are specific topics, we can put them in the comments, let us know, find a way, send a carrier pigeon and we will um, certainly try to address those. Yep. Uh, but yes, there are some broad spectrum herbs that work really well for anybody who is in a fair bit of inflammation, be that internal inflammation, such as um, like uh, if you had Crohn's disease, colitis, uh, you've done chemotherapy and the inside is a bit inflamed, or those who have been in trauma, they just hit, they bang, they hurt themselves. Um, these herbs have a lot of uh, effect in all those realms. Okay, let's talk about some of them, Brian, so we can address it. Mm -hmm. Okay. As, as, and you know me. I, I it, know it, you. Listeners, you know I love a run-on sentence, so I have to check in. Um, so the first one is turmeric and cur slash curcumin. So curcumin is a chemical that comes out of the turmeric plant and we don't absorb it very well on our own but with black pepper long pepper and ginger and other ways that they can manipulate the curcumin you can absorb quite a bit of it the amount of research into turmeric and curcumin is robust it is an extremely safe extremely useful swiss army knife helps everything from the joints to the the organs to the lungs to the immune system which all take a hit when you're doing um you know some of the more advanced or intense medical interventions that again have a place and may be very necessary for you and curcumin can and turmeric can walk right in there and be a really good assistant mm -hmm. now i can see that there are some people who feel that maybe if they have enough, uh, you know, if they take medicine and if they take pills, etc., there is no need to go on, on an extra herbal or, or even uh, put more stuff in there. Explain mm -hmm. to us, Brian, how do those exactly work together, actually, go hand in hand? So it's not necessarily one or the other, mm -hmm. but you can use them basically hand in hand. Yep. Yep. So for, to the person who says, I can't take one more thing, I just can't, I already have too much going on, why would I take herbs? I still think the herbs would be useful, but I love to meet people where they're at and I say, then don't, like absolutely don't do that. Um, however, if someone says, I can't take one more thing, but I need a lot of help and I want herbs, but I don't want to, I go, well, it's one more capsule and it works very, very well because again, with with the conditions and the situations we're talking about we're talking about people who are getting targeted treatments that do some collateral damage to the body mm -hmm. in the name of protecting health that's mm -hmm. at least the goal that's what we hope is happening um and the the botanicals are coming in in the behind and they're supporting the body because no matter what when you get a treatment no matter how medically important that treatment is, no matter how much I will sit here and on my soapbox say, get that treatment, you need it. Yeah. If it comes with collateral damage to the human body, the human body is going to do what it does, which is try to heal. And when we give botanicals that help the body try to heal, that's okay. That is fine. It does not 
there's no evidence that I'm aware of where it benefits the negative side of disease, you know, where someone yeah. <laughs> took curcumin and got worse because of, a, you know, it fed the bad thing. That's not really in the literature. Uh, instead, the body gets a foundational hit from the therapeutic and wants to just live and be here and be present. And the herbs help facilitate that by being antioxidant, promoting um muscle growth, promoting the absorption of nutrients, healing the gut so nutrients can be absorbed rather than just being on IV nutrition. Yeah. Um, all of these things are what the, the herbs are doing while the therapy does whatever its targeted thing is. Yeah. So you have some more of these really hard hitting, uh, good hitting, very gentle, supportive, <laughs> so to speak, herbs yep. for the real serious diseases. Mm -hmm. The next one I want to talk about is a, it's a group, and then I'll focus on one of the group, which is mushrooms. So if you have chronic illness, um, if you are being treated for cancer, um, there's lots and lots and lots of research on mushroom therapies as being really helpful. What are they doing? They help the adrenal glands, the stress response. They work very well with the immune system. Um, there is some research that suggests that they support the immune system in its natural killer cell activity. And natural killer cells naturally kill cells that are not good, aka cancer cells. Um, among other things. So uh, one of the herbs that I, or the mushrooms that I highlighted though was reishi, um, Ganoderma lucidum. Reishi is a wonderful, wonderful mushroom that does everything that I just mentioned. You can get it in capsule form or you can find ways to drink it, decoct it and eat it. Um, but absolutely mushrooms are your friend. So when you talk about mushrooms, Brian, though, so you mentioned the reishi mushroom, but does that also extend to other mushrooms to eat? And we're talking eating, right? We're not talking uh, hallucinogenic mushrooms or something. No, no, or something. Oh, no, no. We're talking no, no, of eating, ones. consuming <laughs> mushrooms for food. I do mean edible mushrooms yes. and not magic mushrooms. And that could be any type of mushrooms? So the answer to that is yes, but... So, or yes, and. So if you look at our more culinary mushrooms, uh -huh. they're, they tend to be groomed for flavor and it changes that phytochemical piece. Whereas reishi mushroom, um, turkey tail mushroom, cordyceps mushroom, lion's mane mushroom. These are all mushrooms that are not well known for their flavor, but are very renowned for their medicinal properties. So if you're going to have your portobellos, they're still helpful. Um, but they are, they've just lost some of their medicinal teeth, if you will, um, in the name of flavor. And there's actually another question. When we talk about the medicinal property or their, their, their medicinal really hot power, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, do those have to be organic mushrooms? Always prefer be farm when somebody says we, we take farm raised mushrooms. Mm -hmm. how, what do you think about them? It depends on what we mean by farmed raised because there are many mushroom operations for medicinal mushrooms um, in this country that are really amazing. Mm -hmm. They're thinking big picture. It's absolutely organic. It's absolutely uh, nature simulating. Um, so there is ways to farm our mushrooms in a healthy, holistic way. Um, that's one of the beauties of of the fungi world is that they are, you know, fungus are very, very adaptable. And if you've ever tried to get black mold out of your bathroom, you know how adaptable mushrooms and fungus can be. So they have lent themselves very well to industry. That said. I always organic, especially when you're trying to use it for improving your health. Uh, you want to make sure there's no pesticides anywhere near there. There's nothing else being involved in manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Mushrooms is really great. So, so the ancients very often referred to mushrooms as mana, the bread from heaven, because it has so many medicinal properties in it. Absolutely. 
And if you're going to go wild foraging for mushrooms, please, please take a couple classes because there are many poisonous lookalikes. They are just as strong at hurting us as they are at helping us. Just depends on the species. <laughs> yes, actually, and on that note, just so you know at home, I am actually going to do a series on also on mushrooms going forward so that we all learn about mushrooms, how to recognize the edible ones, how to recognize wh which ones to pick and not to go out. This is not a time when you just go out and pick blindly and try things. So you, you, it's, you need to have someone who really knows what they're doing. You got to learn at least the basics before you go running out there. Exa um, exactly, exactly. Okay, so we talked about mushrooms. We talked, so we talked about two. You got another one for us? In I that got one time? more for you. Um, I've got one more herb that I absolutely adore, has come in and been such a, a, a friend to me um, when I'm kind of stumped and I'm not getting anywhere with my patients, um, which happens. You know, as a naturopathic doctor, um, I listen to my patients. I listen to what their goals are and I try to adapt my treatment plan plans to them and give them as much education as possible. And sometimes we spin our wheels for a little bit and I can get quite, uh, it can get quite uncomfortable because they want to feel better and I want them to feel better. And an herb that comes in when that's happening for me is called uh, Chinese skullcap or Scutellaria bicolensis is its Latin name. This is an herb that is just a wonderful anti-inflammatory, a wonderful anti-cancer herb, uh, and has been studied for everything from migraine to skin disorders uh, to helping people with cancer, all while working with their medications, aka not having an herb drug interaction. Mm -hmm. So it's a beautiful plant, um, and I definitely recommend people look it up. It, you can get a little confused because there's two popular skull caps. There's a skull cap, just the word, and that's an anxiolytic herb. It helps you calm down. It's in a lot of sleepy time teas. It'll be called Scutellaria lateriflora, mm -hmm. whereas Chinese skull cap will have the word Chinese in front of it. Um, and Chinese skullcap is Scutellaria bicolensis. So it's a little bit confusing, but I wanted to offer this to everyone because the one I'm talking about, Chinese skullcap, is such an amazing herb for when I can't get things to move and I want them to, but is still very, very user-friendly, safe, mm -hmm. not, no big side effect profile, no herb drug interactions, that kind of stuff. Now, just for our viewers to know also, um, <laughs> I think we lost the camera. <laughs> so just for, our, just for our viewers to know also, if you do have any questions in terms of how to use that or what form or, or in, in what shape you want to use it or whatsoever, I would encourage you to reach out to me. You can reach out to me on Twitter. That's always the best way. My Twitter handle is at ndividar um, or direct message me or send us a note go to the youtube page when it's posted give us uh, give us um, questions or comments you can also if you're interested and of course um, if you, when you're watching here the best way even here applies to reach out directly to me i think i would be more than happy to Mm -hmm. Consult with Brian and we'll get back to you and, and, and answer some of these topics and, and questions. And now, I'm one thing I want to talk about, Brian, because we mentioned anti-inflammatory, and I think it's not quite so easy for people to understand the connection necessarily between cancer, for example, and mm -hmm. inflammation. Can you give us the spec on why inflammation or anti-inflammation is actually mm -hmm. so critical? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple things here, as always. So firstly, a lot of times when we talk about anti-inflammatory, uh, especially in the herbal world, we do mean this term inflammation modulation, which is to modulate inflammation because there's healthy, normal, natural inflammation that's part of the body's way of being and is normal and happens every single minute of every day. Mm. With chronic inflammation, inflammation that is unchecked where the immune system is having to deal with an insult be it a self-made insult in autoimmune conditions or you know 
you keep smoking cigarettes and you keep imbibing inflammatory molecules. Um, what happens is that inflammation will naturally kill cells that it, that, that, that have to deal with that inflammation. And that's not just your immune system, right? A good example is smoking causing lung cancer, right? The lung cells can only deal with so much inflammation. With that continuous insult, we eventually start to see the body in an attempt to adapt can then maladapt. And now you've got cancer. Now you have cells growing out of control because all that inflammation creates DNA damage and creates change. Mm. And so that is what's going on there. Mm. And, and just to clarify, and, and um, so my understanding is, Brian, I read this actually in a book, that cancer is, is growth that is, um, what's the English word, that has kind of off on the wrong on the wrong track, so to speak, because yeah, growth normally growth. is a normal growth is a normal part of life, right? But the thing with cancer is that it's it's gone totally off on the wrong track. Yep. So it's unbridled growth of a particular cell line that has just like the thing that's the problem with cancer is that growth is normal and part of life, but so is death. Mm -hmm. Death is normal and part of life. And that is very true in our cellular makeup where cells grow, divide, mm -hmm. and die. That is normal. That's what they should be doing. In cancer, we see a variety of different disruptions to the normal health and cell cycle of growth and rebirth and then, de then death. Mm -hmm. That death piece stops happening and you just get these cells that will grow and grow and grow and reproduce and reproduce. And the rate with which they, they die is is become mess, you know, unhealthy. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, that growth does with the other, the healthy part of growth, right? You have a baby, that baby doesn't stay a baby, it evolves, it becomes a teenager, and then an adult, and then an older adult, and then an elder. Yeah. And so all the normal evolution is all disrupted because the growth is disrupted. And so then it starts going into different places, the bone, it starts to metastasize, it starts to do things, because it's trying to grow but all this growth is not what we want and it's not healthy for human life mm, exactly so uh, we talked about inflammation we, we we clarified a little bit the the inflammation part the chronic inflammation part over the the normal inflammation part and then how it applies to more serious conditions brian anything else you want to use on those more serious conditions in terms of herb before we go to a lighter side of life yes um so I could go on and on about this topic. What I will say though to wrap it up is when it comes to chronic inflammation and chronic conditions, every single person needs a unique approach that reflects them. And so that is why working with clinicians who are focused on holistic health, mm -hmm. functional medicine, and the evidence that supports that are all your, your friends and teammates because they're going to be looking at your unique picture because it becomes very personal as the inflammation goes on and on. And there have been, just for our viewers to know also, there have been tremendous um, successes actually with holistic approaches to heal things like um, cancer and, and yeah. other serious diseases mm -hmm. um, with certain patients over time and, and focus and most above all get to a point where it's calmer and more a little bit off the, the thought, off the worry and more focused on the, the other areas of life, right? Some have said unbelievable results. Yeah, unbelievable <laughs> results. There you go. Now I want to shift, of course, we don't want to end the show on the serious part. So I want to shift to mm -hmm. a more lighter side of life. So in light of Valentine's coming up, Brian, you mentioned that at the beginning. Um, mm -hmm. Let's talk about how herbs can actually help us with libido. Yeah. So, I mean, it's one of the more fun parts of herbalism. You know, we always get like sidestepped into the more serious things that need our attention. But we must remember that herbalism is fun. It is useful in every aspect of human life because humans, as we said at the beginning, grew up with plants. And we learned all sorts of things about the different plants and what they can do. And one of the things that as a society we've always been interested in is sex. You know, sex sells, as they say, and this is and so herbs were looked at for how to help improve um, 
the passionate fires of of the day help you have the energy help the human you know physiology if you have trouble with actual intercourse there are all different herbs that help with these things and there's no you know they've been here and they've been helping for a really long time <laughs> and ancient societies were really kind of ahead of the curve on that one weren't they <laughs> They were actually focusing on exactly that <laughs> aspect. <laughs> I didn't want to say a whole thing about how reproduction was very important in the ancient world, so that's <laughs> why. But it's also actually why. So, <laughs> um, but some herbs that you may know about are, uh, let's talk about chocolate, right? So chocolate is part of... Um, it's an aphrodisiac, you know, right? What? It's yeah, an it's like the Valentine's Day queen is chocolate but specifically in chocolate there is tryptophan which is a building block to serotonin which is a brain you know part of our brain chemistry for sexual arousal as well as a chemical called uh phenylethylamine which our body actually helps us it helps with the falling in love sensation but it also actually helps with having the ability to send blood to our um, reproductive tissues so that we can better perform and enjoy ourselves. Uh -huh. So when we talk about chocolate, Brian, um, mm -hmm. are we talking mainly about dark chocolate or does milk chocolate do this, the trick too? So when I talk about chocolate, I am talking about Theobroma cacao. That is the scientific name. That is where we're getting the darkest of dark, the origin of chocolate. Right. So as cl the closer you can get, to, to the raw dark of chocolate, right? <laughs> yeah, the closer you can get to raw cacao, the clo the more of that chocolate benefit you're getting. Milk chocolate is a little further away yeah. from raw cacao, but if that's all you can enjoy, it doesn't mean it's not doing anything. It's just not as potent. Yeah. So chocolate, is that as a drink, is that, actually who was that who used the hot chocolate, was that, I forgot, who invented actually the hot chocolate as an aphrodisiac? I don't know, but a up. little hot chocolate with some rose syrup and cayenne pepper, I mean, yes. I can go on. Um, I actually, once upon a time, I did a fundraiser for my university and I made chocolates for Valentine's Day. So that was, that was certainly, and they were very popular. Okay. And one of the things I put in the chocolate was, was the powder of an herb called maca. Um, has anybody, you know, if you've heard of maca, some people have, some people haven't. Maca is a stimulating herb, M-A-C-A, -A, maca. This herb is a powder. That's traditionally how it's, you know, how you'll get it. You'll either find it in capsules or you can buy the powder and put it in things. Um, and maca is a stimulant. So it will give you energy. It will also improve libido. It has been studied up, down for, and that is for people of all genders. Um, it's, you know, it kind of helps everybody. We talked uh, about uh, ashwagandha and shatavari in the last episode, how one is better for men and one is better for women. Yes. Maca is better, is okay for everybody um no fun side tricky. effects brian but no side effects right uh unless unwanted pregnancy is on your <laughs> list okay well okay yeah, well. careful use protection do the right thing um but outside of that no um it's it's really all about um just promoting the energy and desire um another herb that i love is called damiana so damiana is this it firstly it tastes delicious it's just this most delicious leaf um there is a liqueur of it i believe and you can find it in like artisanal liquor stores i've seen it um but you can also get the tea online damiana very much helps with the heart portion of libido it helps with connection and desire um whereas i talk about ashwagandha ashwagandha is going to help with energy and it will actually promote erectile function and testosterone. It okay. does those things. I, I was going to say, so we need to clarify here something, Brian, because when we talk about uh, the, the heart connection and mm -hmm. sort of connecting the heart with the desire, a lot mm -hmm. of people could say, well, they may have the desire, but not necessarily the heart range. And some people have the heart range, but not necessarily the desire. So exactly. this one that bridges the two, is that how we understand it? Absolutely, yes. And this is is a famous herb in South America that was given to brides and grooms. It was given as part of um, celebration. 
in wedding festivities because it promotes connection and bonding. And of course, that will help with newlyweds and uh, their honeymoon. So uh, that's why I like Damayana. It's this because it really hits on that desire and connection piece. Whereas like the other herbs we talk about, maca and ashwagandha and shatavari, these herbs work very well at the physiological aspects of what is needed to be in the mood. Chocolate is like Damayana. It's sort of in the middle ground. It's going to help the mind, but it does also help the actual physiology. Um, and so these are all really, really good herbs. And they work for both men and women? They do. Ashwagandha works better for men. And Shatavari, asparagus resimosis, a Shatavari works better for women. However, there can be some crossover, but that's just like a simple rule to just for everyone to hang on to. Because Ashwagandha improves testosterone in men. Um, and so that can play a huge role in sexual function. Um, so yeah, so, so those are those are some herbs. And don't forget cherries, also a wonderful herb. Well, okay, well, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about cherries too. But when you hear all this, so you know, you at home, we just gave you, I think, a really wonderful layout for Valentine's if you do want to prepare for it. Um, you can certainly, we come to our Facebook page also, we can post some more of these exact herbs and mm. perhaps some suggestions. And then why don't you share with us if you're trying it out, how you plan to use it, and then also maybe report back to us on some of the effects. Right, yeah. Brian? We would like to hear that. I, you know, I am an, a budding sexologist. People <laughs> let me know. Okay, so let's talk about cherry. So, so when you have, well, first of all, so the mocha and the chocolate, Brian, we can mm -hmm. mix and mingle those, right? So it's yes. not going to be like an over, I should say that, an overstimulation. <laughs> I haven't heard of anyone being too overstimulated by the herbs we talked about today, with maybe the exception of maca. Okay. Maca, is, uh, I've heard people, and it's not that there was any harm done, but they stayed up, they were up all night, like they weren't tired. It's, it's, a, it's a stimulant. So like wired. Yeah, similar to taking coffee at 9 p.m. You know, it's like, well, I yes. hope you want to have a late night. <laughs> okay, now cherries. Mm -hmm. So cherries, cherries are not only delicious and sweet, but they're actually really useful. Um, they, they have a little bit of a, a preference for men in that they actually can help with uh, erectile dysfunction, if that's something that you deal with. Um, but for everybody, they taste quite good and are well known for just being another classic herb. And perhaps they're named... Uh, you know, a romantic herb because they're red, the, the cherry is somewhat heart shaped, you know, there's a little bit of that poetic aspect. Yeah. But we do know that um, just like it treats gout, it can treat other blockages of blood flow, including erectile dysfunction. Okay, we're almost out of time, Brian, but I do want to, as we long as we talk about fruits, for example, of Valentine, there's always the chocolate strawberries, where do they figure in into all of yep. this? Well, the chocolate does the chocolate and the strawberries are really the vehicle for the chocolate. Um, there's not an infinite amount of data that I'm aware of and I'm welcome. You, know, you guys can always send me back to the books. I'll look it up again. Um, but there's not too much about the aphrodisiac quality of strawberries other than how people tend to eat them. Um, and the mechanical nature of that is part of bonding and that can be very fun for people. Um, other really lovely foods that I can think of off the top of my head. We talked about cherries. Um, the other thing is not eating heavy. How about this? Uh, what not to eat? Avoid a greasy meal. Don't go out for Indian curry um, on your your favorite, your hot date, uh, just because these things tend to just overall not keep you light and focused and energized. They're, they're grounding foods that help you calm down and just kind of get a little bit tired. So maybe avoiding the greasy foods yep. is my fastest and we're uh, out of time brian thank you so much for coming on thank you so much for watching stay tuned with us we have a lot more herbs to cover actually in the weeks to come you can go to the facebook page you can go to our youtube page which is youtube.com slash at smart sustainability you can see all the episodes also there if you're interested in um, and as said before feel invited feel encouraged to share with us what you're doing on valentine's day and also maybe on more on the more serious side of life Life. On that note, have a wonderful evening. We'll see you next week. Have a good night.